Okay, so tonight, Be'ezra Hashem, we're going to be continuing with our series of Shirim on the teachings of the Torah of Rav Yitzhak Maya Morgenstern, Rav Yitzhak Shlita. And tonight, Be'ezra Hashem is going to be a little bit different than what we've been doing over the past eight weeks and the eight Shirim that we've given so far. Not different in the sense that it's not part of the continuity, but it's a direct continuation from what we've been speaking about. In particular, what we spoke about last week with regards to the Bechina of Malchus, the presence of this worldly experience that's in truth rooted in Reisha Dlo Isida, and the doubts that emerge from that place. But what's going to be different is that for the previous eight Shirim, I would have been able to, if anyone was asking me to, to show you 20 or 30 places in thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of Ravichamaya Morgenstern's writings, and I would be able to show you specific places where those ideas are written out at length, to the point that a person can claim that they are fundamental sugyos in the teachings and in the Torah of the Amha Chachma, in the Torah of Ravichamaya. With regards to tonight's teaching, while there are countless places where it is brought up, there are countless places where it is hinted to, there is a lot of time spent clarifying what these concepts mean, but nevertheless it differs from the previous sugyos that we've discussed in the sense that it is not clear that it is a fundamental sugyo. Meaning to say that every single shir that we've given until now is my own humble understanding of the writings of Ravichemeyer Morgenstern, the writings of the tzaddik that come down through his Talmidim. Tonight's shir is even more my own humble opinion because I can't even point to the explicit sources that show that this is one of the fundamental pieces of the puzzle. But nevertheless, everything that you've heard until now and everything that you will hear from the future, when I say until now, I mean all the way from Rav Cook all the way down to whatever shirim we continue giving, Bezra Sashem, this sugya is fundamental to my understanding, and in particular, my understanding of Ravichamaya Morgenstern's teachings. Nevertheless, it's not as explicit in terms of length or volume, and the amount of times that it's expressed explicitly is not as clear as the other sugyos that we've discussed. Secondly, today is also Ravichamaya Morgenstern's birthday. And it's the second night of Hanukkah, so everything that we say tonight should be for a bracha for the tzaddik, that he should continue living a long and healthy life, teaching more and more Torah to the Jewish people, and that his Torah and his light and the light of Hanukkah should spread forth throughout the world, and the Torah of all of, of, all of the tzaddikim ha'amitim should spread forth throughout the world, and that it should bring comfort to the Jewish people and to the world at large. The title of tonight's shir is going to be Tasting the Whole in the Part. Now, the fundamental basis of this concept is going to be based on an idea brought down in the name of the Rashash, Rav Shalom Sharabi, which is explicit in the writings of the Arizal as well as the Yafa Sha'a and the Meforshe of the Arizal point out. But it really underwent its full revolution into a fundamental piece of the puzzle in terms of what it means to learn Kabbalah and what that might mean for us in 2019 in the Talmud Mufak of the Rashash, based on whose name Rav Itchemeyer's base Medrash is referred to as Taurus Chacham. Rav Chaim de la Rosa, the Taurus Chacham, who we spoke about in, I believe, the first year of this series. Now, the idea is as follows. Haklal the haprat shavim lagamre the general principle and the particular aspect are equalized entirely. The general picture, the klal, the highest level of understanding that we have, where all things are unified, the bechina of chachma, the bechina of reisha lo isyada, that place where or is fully revealed, the klal and the prat, the prat which is fragmentation, which is differentiation, which is bina, which is the left-minded experience of discerning differences between things, in spite of the fact that based on human logic, they appear to be fully separate from one another to the point that there's no greater opposition than between the klal and the prat, or the whole and the part. Nevertheless, what the Rashash, based on the writings of the Arizal and the Torah's Chacham explain at length, and Ravitch Meyer brings it down in countless places, the klal and the prat are shoven. That, what we see when we look at the full total picture of how things are supposed to be, 
the full narrative where the beginning, the middle, and the end form together to create a picture that is greater than the sum of its parts. That place which has no distinction, that place which has no stira and no darkness, the klal, the klaliutakol, what the Zohar refers to as Raza de Klal Hakula, the secret of the general principle of all things, where all things meld together to create a unified image without distinction. And the Prat, that Raza de Pratiyut, that secret of differentiation and fragmentation and difficulty and concealment, where the light of the unified whole is no longer apparent. And when we confront the world, we see disparity and fragmentation and one thing fighting against the other, in spite of the fact that based on our human logic and our human conception of what this world is, in spite of the fact that they appear to be so separate and apart and antithetical to one another, what our Mikubalim, what the Rashash comes to teach us is that from the histaklus hapnimis, from an inner vision that descends and gazes deeply into the DNA of all things, we come to find that the klal and the prat are shove, that they're equal. Now, what that means on a practical level, in order for us to begin to understand what Rav Meyer is going to be teaching us, what it means is that no matter how small, no matter how particularized, no matter how fragmented the prat appears, no matter how distant and removed from the general light of clarity associated with the klal, when a person descends deeply enough into that prat, into that particular aspect of something that stands in front of the person at that moment, what a person will come to find that within the recesses of that particularity, a person will come to find recesses and resources of the entirety of everything within it. That there is no part so small that it doesn't contain the DNA or the essence of everything. The reason that we're capable of seeing a shivoy of an equality between the klal and the prat, between the totality and the fragments, between chachma and between bina, or between the expressivity of chesed and the constriction of gvura, is because both are rooted in the same place. Both the klal and the prat, the general principle, as well as the particular point, both emerge for Ravichamaya Morgenstern following the path of our mikubalim, both emerge out of the infinite whole out of or in sof, out of the infinity of godliness, so to speak, to the point that we cannot even begin to fathom what that infinity means. That place which we've spoken about where we can only say, Lais machshava that human mind cannot grasp it. And that in spite of the fact that we have no access to this general principle of the infinity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we have access to it by way of its midos, by way of its revelations in our lives, like we've been speaking about throughout in the Shirim. Because both the klal and the prat emerge out of the infinite whole, out of the infinity that cannot be added upon, nor can it be detracted from, because it's an infinity that's greater than anything we could ever conceive of, what we refer to as HaKadosh Baruch Hu B'chvodu V'atzmo Kavyachol, that achdos, that impossible unity that stands outside of our capacity to grasp, gives birth to two differentiated expressions of existence. It gives birth to klaliut, to the totality of things, to the wholeness of things, to the chachma of things, to the right side of things, and it gives birth to the pratiyut, to the particularity and to the fragmentation of things, to the left side of things, to the constriction of things. Now, from a perspective of this worldliness, when as subjects who exist at the lowest level of malchus to malchus to asiya, the lowest possible expression of divinity in the world, from our perspective, there seems to be no greater distance than between the klal and the prat, between the whole and the part. But from the perspective of godliness, mitzido kavyachol, which our Torah and Panimiya Sator has given us access to, we can now see almost what it feels like to see from the perspective of godliness, so to speak where we're able to see that the prat and the klal, in spite of how separate and apart they seem from one another, nevertheless, they're two different but unified expressions of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's light into our world. Now, the Rashash and Rav Itchemeyer 
based on the writings of the Rashash, especially in this explanation on Perish Hakdamas Rehovah Sanar in Yam HaChachma Tavshin Samaches, describe this at length. The typical way of looking at the world, the typical way of looking at our experiences, is that we confront fragmentation, that we experience life as operating under the cut of lack, as being deficient, as missing something, and that out there, beyond us, or beyond our world, there's something whole. There's a perfection that if we work hard enough, we can eventually reach it. The way this is described in the language of Ravitchamayar, based on the writings of the Rashash, is that there is something referred to as Yud Svero Shlemos, something that is comprised of the 10 total Sviros, which means that they have the upper three Sviros of Keser, Chachma, and Bina, as well as the lower three Sviros, which are Chesed, Gvura, Teferas, Netzachod, Yesod, and Malchus to the point that those two categories of spheros, the three upper spheros, which represent spiritual awareness, and the lower seven spheros, which represent emotional living, are unified to create a whole. And then on the opposite side, you have something referred to as a vak, vav ktsavos, only six sides, a concept of deficiency that doesn't have the keser chachma urbina. All it has is the chesed, gvur, tferes, netzach, hoid, yisod, and malchus. So that on the one hand, you have a totality of Yud Sviros, and on the other hand, you have things that are missing the upper three Sviros. And from that perspective, our job as deficient creatures who are lacking those upper three Sviros, which represent divine conception or contemplation of godliness in the world or drawing down spiritual consciousness into ourselves, if we look at ourselves as being deficient from that perspective, then our goal is to rectify ourselves and refine ourselves enough to draw down and merit those three upper qualities that we're missing through our positive actions and through our effort. But until we're zoichet to reach those mochen, until we merit to draw down those lofty lights of consciousness, we're deficient. That was the regular perspective of Kabbalah Sa'arizal, that things are deficient, and in order to become whole, they have to elevate themselves or they have to draw down fullness to fix themselves completely. What Ravitchamayar Morgenstern points out so deeply based on the Rashash is a different conception. He says as follows, that when looking at the Prat, when looking at that thing which is in theory, deficient, instead of looking at it as fully deficient, needing fullness that comes from beyond it, we can look at it as something that is full in and of itself, but has not yet expressed its fullness. Meaning to say, instead of looking at that broken prat, at that broken particular aspect, which seems to be missing the essence of Keser, Chachma, and Bina, the divine consciousness or our contemplation of godliness, instead of seeing the individual as lacking, needing to draw something above it, down into it to become full, Ravitchamayar, based on the Rashash, teaches us that we need to be able to look at ourselves as full already, as already shalim, as already containing all Yud Sviros, including the upper three Sviros of Keser, Chachma, and Bina, that will and desire for godliness, that chachma for godliness, that willingness to understand the particularities of godliness, those things already exist within us, even in our deficient state, except we have not rectified or clarified ourselves enough yet to reveal what is already within us. So instead of looking at ourselves as broken, in need of salvation from something that stands beyond us, what the tzaddikim point out and Ravit Shemayar stresses fully is that the fullness already exists within us. The shlemus is already found within the prat. The klal hakula, the entire principle and the general quality of all things, already exists deep within the recesses of that imperfect part. And our job in Avoid Hashem is not to draw down new lights that we have no access to, but rather to be mezachich ourselves, to clarify ourselves and purify ourselves till our natural proclivity of Kedusha emerges to show that it's always been there already. 
that when you look at a vak, when you look at the six spheros that seem to be missing the upper four spheros, so that seem to be missing all of the principles or potencies of Kedusha, instead of feeling that a person has to travel and run far away and give everything they have of themselves in order to secure what they don't have, our tzaddikim are showing us that we already have what we need. We already have within us, in potentia, in an unconscious state, that fullness. Our job is simply to clarify ourselves enough to allow that fullness to be revealed. To the point that what appeared to be deficient is shown to really have been full already, to be a whole in and of itself, but it was a wholeness that was yet to be revealed. And through Avoida, through Bechira, through working through the Avoida of Mesiris Nefesh and Ahava and Yira and Rachamin and all of the different Avoidas that are associated with what it means to be a human being, we reveal retroactively that the part was always whole, but that wholeness was dormant within the part. So that when we look at the difference that we originally assumed, which was fundamental between the part and the whole, or between something that was full and something that was lacking, what we come to realize is that what we thought was lacking was in truth simply dormant, waiting to be revealed to be already part of a wholeness that permeates all of creation. The way that Ravit Shemayer teaches this, based on the writings of the Rashash, is going to be based on another principle from the Rashash, which we brought up already in a number of the Shirim. It's referred to as Klal HaErchin, the theory of relativity, the Kabbalistic theory of relativity, which the Rashash did not reveal Chas V'Shalom. The Rashash did not come to teach anything that was not written beferish in the Arizal, but the Rashash disclosed it from within the text itself. The Rashash showed us how it can be found within the Osios of the Arizal as well. And we discussed already how Klal HaErchin, how the principle of relativity says as follows. Instead of looking at the world of Kedusha and Chol, instead of looking at divine light in the world and those things which appear to be devoid of divine light as absolute differences which create a stark differentiation between what is good and what is bad or what is high and what is low or what is fixed and what is broken, what the Rashash says, Beferush, in his Hakdama Rechova Sanar, which Rav Ichimayar has discussed at length, and his Talmud Mufak, Rav Shmuel Ehrenfeld, Shlita, is also discussing now at length, like we've discussed, is that instead of assuming that there are fundamental or ontological or actual differences between one thing and another thing, we need to begin to realize that everything is part and parcel of the same material. All limitation, everything we confront in this world is rooted in the infinite. So the question becomes, if everything is uniform and rooted in the infinite, where do we see differentiation from? Where does all of the stark differences that we confront on the day-to-day experience of our lives emerge from? And what the Rashash says is, Hakol talui be'erche hakinuyim bilvad. Everything is dependent and contingent upon the particular application of proper names. That's it. The only distinction that exists within the world is our perception of distinction. The only distinction and separateness and differentiation that exists in the infinite world that the infinite God has created is simply the level of awareness that we have with regards to particular levels of experience. So that when we say that something is whole and shalim, when we say that something is holy, it means that it's revealed to us at that point in our awareness that this thing is a vehicle of wholeness, that this thing is a vehicle and it's representative of the wholeness and the perfection that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has revealed in the world. And when we confront something that appears to be the opposite of wholeness, it's not that fundamentally on a DNA level that thing is separate than what the holiness is. It simply means that it's our perception, our conception of things at this point, which changes the nature of what we're looking at. Because all things are equal. According to the Mikubalim, according to Rav Ichimayar, based on the writings of the Rashash, it's impossible to claim that there is a distinction between the level of wholeness and the level of lack. Between something that has yud zero shlemos, ten full zeros, and something that is lacking in the upper three zeros and only has six or seven lower zeros. The only difference is how we choose to look at it. 
So when it comes to looking at the particular aspects of our lives, when it comes to trying to understand what the Mikubalam are describing, there's always three ways to look at something. There's looking at the thing in and of itself, and in and of itself, even though it's a particular, it already contains a dormant wholeness within itself. So that if you descend deeply enough into the DNA of that experience, you can find that what you thought was lacking is in truth whole. And then you can look at it from the perspective of a level that is above it. And then from that perspective, we see ourselves as lacking because we haven't fully emerged to that higher level yet. And in relationship to something that is lower than it, we conceive of ourselves as whole. So, for example, a person who learns 10 hours a day, vis-a-vis themselves, they are whole. That's 10 hours of learning. That's their experience. The individual who is above them learning 12 hours a day is going to cause the person who learns 10 hours a day to feel deficient vis-a-vis that level. So vis-a-vis the level above us, that wholeness is now revealed to be deficient. But vis-a-vis the level below, which is the person who learns 8 hours a day, the 10 hours a day of learning are shown to be fully expressive of perfection. So we see that no matter where you look, no matter which perspective you're looking at, there are three different ways of looking at the same exact thing. From one perspective, it looks full. From the other perspective, it looks deficient. And from the other perspective, it looks as if it were whole. Which goes to show, according to Ravitchemeyer Morgenstern, Everything is made up of the same properties. Everything is made up of the same potential. Everything is made up of the same DNA. So in reality, there is nothing that cannot be full. The only difference is what perspective are we using to look at it. Now, the way this is applied in practical avoida for Avichamayr is as follows. Our natural way of looking at the world is that we live in within pratyus, we live within the state of fragmentation, we live within the state of that which is lacking the fullest fixing of things. And outside of us, there exists a fullness that awaits us. If we can only work hard enough, if we can only be miyageya enough, then we will finally, eventually, at the end of days, find fullness. But when we begin to look at the world and our experiences, and each of every one of our own feelings and anxieties and experiences and moments in our lives, when we look deeply into the broken fabric of those things which are fragmented in our lives, the pratiyut of our lives, according to this principle of klaleha ha'erchen, which teaches us that everything that is broken is in truth full, we come to find that in the moment that we're in, with the materials that we have, with the experiences and the awareness that we have in that moment, that's all we need. That's enough for a person to be able to find access to holiness, for a person to be able to find access to wholeness. That in spite of the fact that we feel broken, in spite of the fact that things feel dark, in spite of the fact that things feel like they're a prat, in spite of the fact that things feel fragmented and unwhole, if a person descends deeply into the recesses of that experience and they draw down the awareness that even the brokenness that we experience is a direct symptom of how HaKadosh Baruch Hu has created the world, what we come to find is within that chisaron itself, within that brokenness itself, within that pratiyut itself, there exists a klaliyut hakol, that in every part that we touch, we're touching the whole. Because when you're dealing with the infinity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when you're dealing with the profoundly impossible unity of God, who is unified both in wholeness and in fragmentation, both in darkness and in light, we come to realize that there's no distinction between the Klal and the Prat. That there's no distinction between the future and the now. And that all of those things which are reserved for the future when things fully rectify themselves can also be found in the present if a person enables themselves to descend deeply enough into that experience. Now, Chazal have already expressed this idea in Masechus Brachos, 
when describing the leave taking that one Tana would have from another. And Avichemeyer Morgenstern brings this down as many tzaddikim bring it down. What each Tana would say to the other is, Oilamecha tirebechayecha. You should merit to see your world in your days. And the way the Meforshim and the Mikubalim and the Balatanya and Rabbi Nachman and the Vilna Gona as well and Rav Yitzhak Isaac Haver, and nearly all of the Tzadikim, the Tzlach in his Haktamatis, Perish on Agadatas, it's a unanimous announcement. The altar of Slobodka in a remarkable mimer, a remarkable mimer in Orhat Saflun, in the concealed and hidden light in Parshas Bereshis about Adam Arishon in Gan Eden, the altar of Slobodka writes about this Indian of Olamecha Tira Bechayecha. And it's such a profound teaching to the extent that people could not believe that the altar of Slobodka actually wrote this. People felt that it was the result of his Talmud Rav, Rav Avram Svi Finkel. Rav Avram Svi Finkel, I'm mispronouncing the last name. I don't think it was Rav, Rav Avram Svi Kaplan. Rav Avram Elia Kaplan, I apologize. Rav Avram Elia Kaplan, who died very young, unfortunately, who was a Tabin Mofuk of the altar of Slobodka, and he was also a profound poet and musician, and he wrote poetry, and he had a deep interaction with different Sadiqim of the generation. People could not believe that the altar of Slobodka would have written what he wrote about this concept of Olamecha Tira Bechayecha, so they wanted to claim that it was Rav Avram Elia Kaplan who pretended to be speaking the words of his Rebbe about this profound idea of Olamecha Tera Bechayecha. And I had the schus with good friends to be able to be in Yeshiva Schevron last year. And we had, or I had a meeting with Rav David Kohn, the Rosh Hashiva. And I asked Rav David Kohn if this teaching, Olamecha Tera Bechayecha, from the altar of Slobodka, can be considered an authoritative teaching because it's so profound. And Baruch Hashem, he understood what I was asking, obviously, and he said, even if it wasn't written by the altar of Slobodka, it's the Ruach of the altar of Slobodka, which is a very uh, a special answer. Anyway, many tzaddikim have discussed this idea of Olamecha Tira What our tzaddikim point out is that what the Tanayim were trying to say to one another is that you should merit to see your world in your days. You should merit to understand that everything that stands at the ready for you in the future Everything that seems to be just beyond the horizon of this worldliness, that fullness, that shlemus that we're promised for the end of time, we have the ability of drawing that down into our present moment. We have the ability of taking that future fullness and tasting it in the present. When we're capable of realizing that even within the present moment, as broken and as fragmented it as appears, there is still a fullness that is inherent within it because the present nature of reality in all of its brokenness is still representative of the fullness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So Olamecha Tira Bechayecha meant that may you be able to draw down the light of the klal. May you be able to see how the klaliyut of everything is contained within the prat that the klal and the prat are shavin legamre, that the vak and the gar are both the same, that fullness and lack are just simply different ways of looking at something. The way Rav Itchemeyer Morgenstern describes this, and I haven't seen it in the later svarim, but I see that it's coming out more and more recently, and it was already hinted to, obviously, in Tafshin Ayin Dalid. Rav Itchemeyer describes this capacity of the individual to recognize on a psychological level the klal and the prat being shoved, and the fact that everything that we look at is contingent in our own conception, meaning to say that if we look at a situation as broken, then it's broken. But if we're capable of recognizing that even in that brokenness, there exists a dormant wholeness that will eventually reveal itself to show that even that which was broken was fixed, then a person is capable of drawing down the future into the present or tasting the whole in the part. Rav Itchemeyer writes as follows with regards to the Midah of Bitachon, that in contradistinction to the Midah of Emuna, Emuna, which is the belief that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs everything and eventually will show that he has been running everything until now, the Midah of Bitachon, the Midah of Trust, is tasting that future awareness in the present moment, of being aware even on Erev Shabbos that Shabbos is going to come. Or like Rabbi Nachman writes so often and Rav Itchemeyer discusses in his Shirim on the Kavanos of Shabbos, our ability to draw Shabbos into the Sheshes Yimei 
our ability to see that Hayom Yom Rishon B'Shabbos, Hayom Yom Sheni B'Shabbos, Hayom Yom Shlishi, Revi'i, Chamishi, Veshishi B'Shabbos, that in spite of the fact that we see a sharp distinction between Shabbos and Chol, as strong as the distinction between the Klal and the Prat, or as strong as the distinction between unity and fragmentation, nevertheless, there's a level of Kedusha where everything is flipped to reveal that everything, even the fragmentation and even the brokenness and even the darkness, was part and parcel of that fullness, to show the deep, inherent nature of Shabbos that exists within the week itself, to show the deep, inherent klaliyut that exists within the prat itself. Ravit Shemayar writes as follows, and this is in Yam HaChachma Tavshin Ayin Dalid on page 777. He says, Emuna hi laha amin shechol tavar letoiva, that faith is the ability to believe that everything is for the good, and bitachon and trust is to feel already in the present moment the goodness that will be revealed in the future. And he says as follows, bitachon hu shiyesh emuna kol kach chazaka, the concept of bitachon, the concept of trust in God, is so strong that bitachon becomes so strong that it's the vehicle that draws the future awareness of light into the present moment so that a person in the present moment can feel as everything was, is all good. And even though that real good revelation has not been present in reality yet, Mikol makom, nevertheless, may rov ha'amuna u'bitachon, from the great level of amuna and bitachon, harei hu kvar margish achshav echa kol hu rak letova. You already feel at the present moment in the prat itself how everything is part of the klal. And he goes on to say that, and this is the beginning of the pasuk, batach b'Hashem, have amuna in Hashem, va'ase tov. Because when a person has bitachon in Hashem, a person will be zoichet to be mit'aneg ata begile elokus. That even in the present moment, a person will come to recognize the godly presence in that moment. That even in the prat, even in that which appears to be fragmented, even in that which appears to be broken and disparate from what we're looking for in our lives, we will come to find that everything is part and parcel of the whole. Now, the awareness of Ravitchemeyer to make this part of his system that a Jew, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what they have experienced in that moment, if they penetrate deeply enough, they can find that that moment contains everything that they could possibly need, that they can see their world in their days, that the present can be tasted, that future can be tasted in the present, that the yichud ilah, that the unity of Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, which teaches us that there's nothing that exists other than godliness, can be tasted in the Yichud Tata, in the lower Yichud of Baruch Shem Kavon Malchus Alambad, which tells us that there is a world that exists separate and apart from God, Kav Yachol. the ability to draw the light into the vessel. This is the Chiddush of Chasidus. This is the Chiddush of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. That the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, as well as the Gra, and as well as the, the harbingers of Pnim Torah, what they were coming to teach us was simply that we can taste Mashiach even before Mashiach comes. That we can taste the future even in the present. And Rav Shemayar quotes thousands of times, well not thousands of times, that's ridiculous, 20, 30 times at least that I've seen, the concept in the name of the Vilna Gon, in the name of the Leshem Shalom based on the writings of Rav Chaim Vital in Arba Meyo Shekel HaKodesh, that anything that stands at the ready to be revealed in the future can be tasted in the present moment. That anything that stands at the ready to be revealed as the true fullness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the world, with proper effort, with proper awareness, with proper intention and attention seek and attention setting and breathing, a person is capable of drawing that light down into the present. And this was only through the Chiddush of realizing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has never truly removed his infinity from the world. If a person looks at the question of tzimtzum, if a person looks at the question of Hashem removing himself from the world, and they see it as kipshuto, God forbid, and they see it as something that actually happened, like certain machabrim have wanted to show, or not really machabrim, interpreters of machabrim, which is we, what we discussed in the Shirman on the Leshem, 
So then a person sees that Hashem has revealed his fullness, chas v'shalom, and left an aspect of lack. But what the Chiddush of Hasidus and the Chiddush of Pnim Torah is, is that the symptom is only loike pshuto. The symptom is not actual. It's not an actual removal. It's simply a concealment. It's a concealment, which means that if we penetrate deeply enough into the concealment, we could come to find that which is truly present, which is the fullness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That this concept of the klal and the prat being shav, of being able to taste the future and the present, of seeing the whole in the part, of recognizing that even in brokenness there is a wholeness that is dormant within it, that is only symptomatic of the deep awareness which Rav Itchemeyer screams from the top of the rooftops, that simpsum lav kipshuto, that simpsum is only a concealment, it's not a removal, God forbid. To claim that it's a removal would claim that there's a full distinction between fullness and brokenness. And it would say that one thing is truly ontologically separate from the other. But when we begin to see the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is still present by way of concealment, and that the symptom was simply a concealment of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and not a removal, what we're showing ourselves is that even in the most broken prat, we can find the whole. As the Baal Shem Tov says, HaToifes chelek min ha'etzem, toifes et ha'etzem kulo. Somebody who touches a fragment of the whole touches the whole entirely because the whole is retroactively revealed to have never been divisible. That wholeness permeates everything, even imperfection, even brokenness. And for a Vichemeyer, this becomes a derech and avoida, a derech and avoida to recognize that every moment that a person finds themselves in, no matter where they find themselves, they can disclose the true fullness of that moment. But that fullness is not the ultimate fullness. That fullness is simply full in relation to what is below us. But in relation to what is above us, it's ad infinitum like we've spoken about. That leis machshavat tvisa veklau that there's no limit to the wholeness that we can grasp for ourselves. So every moment that we feel a lack, we need to descend deeply into the lack to disclose that it's a whole, only to come to realize that that whole is deficient in relation to a whole that is greater than it, which transforms us back into a state of lack, only to yearn for a further state of wholeness until eventually at the end of time we'll come to a place where it's impossible to even fathom anymore. But Kedushasi Lamalami Kedushasechem, that process of elevating oneself, of taking the prat and elevating it to a klal and then showing that the klal is simply a prat to a higher klal and then ascending again and becoming deficient again, that's in a process ad infinitum. But it doesn't diminish from the fact that in each and every moment a person can taste their world in their days. A person can taste the fullness of the moment. What I want to read from right now it's from the writings of Rav Shmuel Ehrenfeld Shlita, and this is in Ketzeis HaShemesh. This is the second volume of his Parish on the Kavanos of the Arizal on Shavuos and Tzviras HaOmer. And this is on page Tuf Pei Zayin, on 487. It's a footnote, and this is footnote 7 of a singular footnote. Gilui HaOr HaNe'elam B'Toch HaHastara. This is the understanding. This is the psychological benefit that we understand from what we've been discussing. The Omek Ha'inyan Bazehu, the depth of the matter is as follows, that in order to sweeten the judgments and the difficulty and to remove the concealment that exists in the moment, there's no need to draw down a light that was not present beforehand. A person doesn't have to go searching how to fix their moment. Rather, the ikr is to reveal the light that is concealed within the concealment itself. The Pasuk tells us that there is nothing other than godliness. That in truth, even the concealment itself is simply a garment and a layer of concealment to the light. And the pleasure that is hidden within it. And everything that we need to do in our lives is simply come to remove the masecha, to remove that which is concealing the fullness of the moment. Not to draw down fullness into brokenness, but to reveal the fullness that exists within brokenness as well. To end this week's shir, which I could speak, Mamish, at this point I could speak for another hour about this. To end this week's shir, I wanna look at a really interesting 
document almost, an interesting teaching from Vichemeyer, which comes to take this idea and ensure that it doesn't become problematic. Because a person can go beyond the line. A person can go beyond the limitations of what is reasonable to think and say that if the whole is found in the part, if the future is found in the present, if the asid is found in the hove, if wholeness is found in brokenness, then what need is there for us to continue working towards wholeness? Now, what we've explained already, it should be clear, hopefully, that for a Vichemeyer, wholeness is only wholeness relative to the level that we're at. That the wholeness is the ceiling of the ground that I'm standing on, but I come to the next level and I reveal that the, the ceiling was simply a ground. But Rav Meyer Shlita is very aware that people can misunderstand this idea. The Ariza was very aware of that. And Rav Chaim Mital was, and the Vilmagon was, and the Baal Shem Tov was, and Rav Nachman was, and all of our tzaddikim are. And Rav Meyer is afraid of this as well. That a person should come and say, God forbid, that if the whole and the part, or fullness and brokenness, or light and darkness are part and parcel of the same material of the, infi of the infinite, then a person could come and say, God forbid, that there's no need for avoida which is why Rav Meyer quotes so often in the name of the Bris Menucha, something we'll discuss at length next week, that Keser is also the same letters as Kares. That if a person misunderstands the ideas of Keser, that place of nothingness which shows us how wholeness and brokenness are part and parcel of the same thing, a person can eventually lead themselves to a place of Kares, of being cut off from holiness. So Rav Meyer wrote a Haskama, to another tzaddik, to another mashpia in our generation, Rav Itamar Schwartz, the Bala Machaber of Bilvavi Mishkan Evne, and I believe at this point it's above 30 svarim, which are remarkable. Svarim that speak on a level that, in my humble opinion, nobody else in our generation speaks at. The Bilvavi Rav Itamar, I'm sorry, Rav Itamar Schwartz speaks more about Kesar and Reisha de Loisida than any tzaddik before and likely after him. And in certain volumes of the Svarim, it's, it's almost impossible to see how avoda and the need for Bechira is still a possibility. And he wrote a parish on Rehova Sanar from the Rashash. And he only wrote the beginning of a parish on the first two dafim. It's a remarkable sefer. But Ravichemeyer Morgenstern wrote a Haskama to that sefer. And I always knew that this Haskama was an important point. But I wasn't sure until I saw about two weeks ago in Yam HaChachma, Tav Shin Ayin Aleph, that they make reference to this Haskama in showing the fundamentals of a certain idea. But in referring to the writings of the Bilvavi, in referring to these writings that seem to take this idea very, very seriously, that the future can be tasted in the present, Rav Itchemeyer feels the need to push back and show that even though the future can be tasted in the present, even though wholeness can be tasted in the broken, even though the whole can be found in the prat, nevertheless, it's fundamental for us to recognize that whenever we reveal the wholeness within our situation, we have to come and recognize that on the level above us, there is a brokenness that forces us to try and continue to work. Ravichemeyer writes as follows. He says, it's known how fundamentally important it is to learn Kabbalah B'derach HaPanimiyas in the holy path that was revealed to us in the days of the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, as is described in the writings of Rav Aaron Alevi from Strashelia in his, the introduction to his book, Shara Yichad Vamuna. Rav Itchemeyer continues and he says, and it's a blank space because at that time the Bilvavi Mishkanevner of Vitamar Schwarzlita was writing his farm anonymously. He says, we have to recognize the positive things he's done for us because we already have heard throughout the world how wonderful his writings are. And there's a tremendous benefit of learning his writings. And Ravichemeyer says, to make a simple point, to make one at an endem, what this Sadik, what, what, what Rav Itamar Schwartz reveals so often in his writings, that because a person needs to grasp all levels, then naturally a person has the ability to grasp all levels, even the future level, even in the present. He goes on and he describes as follows that even though a person has the ability 
of drawing down the gar into vak, of drawing down wholeness into brokenness, nevertheless, a person has to recognize that it's all relative, that the relative moment that a person finds themselves in, you're right, it's broken, and a person can descend deeply enough into it to reveal that that brokenness contains a whole within itself, to the point that there's no distinction between the future and the present or between avoida and just sitting there deeply aware of Hashem's presence. Nevertheless, a person has to be so deeply aware that even though I've reached a particular level of wholeness, that's only whole vis-a-vis -vis the level that is below me. But above me, that there is an infinite level of growth that I need, that I need to still engage in. Because for Avichemeyer, the animating principle is Kedushasi Lamalami Kedushasechem that the holiness of the infinite is always perpetually just beyond the reach of the limited functioning of human beings. And no matter how far we come in ascending the rungs of Kedusha, we have to always revert back to the fact that we are creations, we are creatures who are by nature chaser, and it's specifically in that awareness of our chisaron that we can find wholeness to the point that the klal and the prat are shav because we're nothing but a reflection of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's wholeness. But Ezra Hashem, next week, what we're going to be discussing is the final shlav, at least in this shlav of Shirman or Vichemeyer Morgenstern, which I'm not sure yet if it's going to be the end or just the beginning. What we're going to be discussing is the Bechina of Mashiach ben David and Mashiach ben Yosef, the unification of the train Mashiachim, who he describes so often in so many of his writings, based on the writings of the Ramchal and Rav Moshe David Vali and our Tzadikim. But suffice it to say that tonight, what we spoke about is part of the Or Haganus, part of that concealed light that is revealed on Hanukkah, that light of the future, which shows us that even the present is part of the future. That even the present moment where things appear to be deficient and broken, what we can find if we disclose it deep enough, that the future rests and resides within the present as well.